Welcome to the Painting of the Week podcast, where we look at some of the most significant paintings throughout history. Introducing your hosts, Phil Grabsky and Laura Bentham. Hello, uh, my name is Phil, and I'm with my friend Laura. Morning, all. And we <laughs> we both like art, and we assume you do too. Otherwise, you wouldn't be listening to our podcast. And today, this week, we're going to talk about a painting by the French artist Jacques-Louis David. And it's a painting that he did in 1793 called The Death of Marat. Actually, I've only just learned that's how you pronounce it. We um, just spent about 10 minutes trying to work it out. Just trying to, yes, we did. In fairness. But, but <laughs> well done, Nora, because... Uh, well, no. <laughs> it sounds right. It's certainly not Marat. I think we can be <laughs> Which is all, where I started. I think, well, no, I think we can safely assume. Anyway, uh, this painting um, is in um, Brussels at the Royal Museum of, or the Royal Museums of Fine Arts of Belgium in Brussels. Uh, there is a copy, which I've also seen in, uh, I'm hesitating now, is it the Louvre? Maybe it's at the Louvre. Have you been to this? Have you been to it? Have you I seen have, it? I have. Flesh? I have. Okay. Uh, one of the great advantages of Eurostar. Yes. Um, although, funnily enough, going off with a complete tangent, the thing I most remember is seeing in another painting one of the cherubs who looked 100% exactly the same as my one year old daughter at the time. <laughs> it was the weirdest thing ever. We were there with her in a pram. Oh. And on, in this painting was her, <laughs> exactly <laughs> the same. Anyway, hopefully we won't end up looking like poor old Mara. No. Oh. So let's start by Laura. Yes. I know you've had a little bit of time to look at this painting. Mm. What do you reckon? Um, what do you think of it? First of all, it's not something I would have hung on my wall, as we're back to that again. <laughs> Um, and when I first saw it, I thought, I'm really going to concentrate this week as to where my eye first went. And uh, obviously, I don't know, I say obviously, for me, it was his face. Mm. I went straight to his face and how, yeah, he looked, he looked quite sort of serene considering he's just been murdered. Mm. Um, but it's actually, now I've looked into it, I've had to do a crash course, obviously, in the French Revolution, the children's version, and the children's version of this painting and found out it's possibly the first, I mean, it's like, it's the original fake news, isn't it? Because uh, David seemed to have come along and changed the whole scene a little bit so, so as to get his point across. So what is, what is the story? What is going on here? <laughs> so you come to this painting and yeah. if you know nothing about it, mm -hmm. And I've just done a crash course, children's. Children. Well, children's version. You might not even immediately realise he's in his, he's in a bath. No. It's kind of interesting if you look at just looking at the bath. I've, I've not really noticed before, but he's got the bath. Obviously, it takes some ages to heat up all the water. So what they've done is they put a board across most of the bath, over which there's a more material, just to keep the water as hot as long as possible, haven't they? Well, yeah, but then they were saying that he has a really bad skin condition ah. and he had to bathe every day. Ah, right. One of them saying in oatmeal, which is a bit ah. something. And so they want him to look like a martyr. This is what I've learned. Okay. And therefore, David, who was his friend, um, painted him without any, flawless, without any of the skin condition, which okay. he, he almost, he almost was sort of, it was debilitating for him. And every day he had to sit in the bath and do his work in the bath. Ah, okay. So actually what we've got here isn't a painting which is necessarily supposed to be, you know, you can imagine if you're looking at a Monet or even a Van Gogh or mm. plenty of other examples mm. where they are, Pleasurable, though, as I've said before, with, with many layers of meaning and, and texture. But this is obviously a, a, a 
a, a interesting, a contemporary history painting. Yeah. So David, if one looks at the history of David, for example, he, he, he does do history paintings and often very grand scale. And they're often reflecting something, I think a few years before this, five or six years before this, he did the death of Socrates. But this is something that they're right in the middle of, i.e. post-French Revolution. Yeah. Now, I'm not quite sure who this painting was intended to be seen by, but it's clearly contemporary history, isn't it? So this is someone that, not your, I mean, I guess most ordinary. I remember reading not so long ago, quite an extraordinary fact that something like 95% of the human, of, of humans, up until relatively recently, were, in, were engaged in the production of food, oh, okay. in particular agriculture. So they're not necessarily, in France, you know, the peasants, the serfs, whatever you want to call them, they're not necessarily going to know who Mara is. They're not necessarily going to know who many of the individuals concerned, you know, that we now know of from the French Revolution or plenty others that we don't. But that elite will will know who Mara is. Yeah. And I guess Jacques-Louis David is, is, is painting it for them. So, okay, so he knew... He knew this guy. He was um, his, well, because he was a part of the Jacobin uh, cause as such. Okay. This well, is what I've learned. Now, when anyone... You've, got, uh, you've taken me to a new level, Phil. Yeah, but whenever, whenever, whenever anyone says something like that, I have to then ask, mm -hmm. so what is the Jacobin cause? Well, they were the people that were trying to overthrow all the clergy, Louis the Sixteenth. Okay. The whole, the whole lot. Okay. So I, in my crash course, of which I have done quite a lot of research this week, because okay. I was so unprepared before, this, well, is, this is why David had to make him look like a martyr. So because he was killed by Charlotte Corday. Okay, so why does, who, she, why does, she, yeah, why does she kill him? Because she thinks he's responsible for her, her sister's death. Okay, and who was but her also, sister? Oh, I don't know. Okay. Got, yeah, yeah, I don't know. Right. But she um, was obviously more for the monarchy and the clergy. Right. And she's tried to con him with this letter to get into his bathroom and then to stab him. Okay, so if we look at that letter... Her name's on it. Oh, yeah. You can see. Charlotte Corday. Mm -hmm. I mean, so many different things are saying. One so of them saying it's a list of names of people and things like that that I didn't really know. So, so she says to the citizen Mara. Mm -hmm. Ah, yeah, you can read this. It's a fight. Uh, I am well, unfortunately, to have the right. Can't read the last line. No. I'm sure somebody has translated it. Yeah. Okay, so, he's, so she, yeah. she's written a letter to him mm -hmm. to gain entrance. Yeah. He sits in the bath frequently mm -hmm. to work, so therefore. Maybe it's not that surprising that his servant has let a visitor yeah, yeah. into his room while he's in the bath. Maybe that's why he's covered up. Maybe it's not to keep in the heat. It's more partly privacy and partly because it's like a working table. Yeah. She's then gone and stabbed him right, right in the chest. Mm. And there's a little dribble of blood there. I mean, it's all, there's almost an illusion you talk about him being martyred. Mm. Um, obviously, Christ has the wound in his chest, and there's definitely a, a connection there. In fact, only yesterday I was looking at a Caravaggio painting where he's got a, a wound like that, which he's being carried. It's an entombment, and he's being carried to his grave, and the guy's almost got his thumb in the wound. And But it's a very similar kind of slash of red paint but they're also saying it's a similar pose. And there's a similar pose. Okay. I mean, I'm only coming out of what I've learned. Yeah, well, no, we, we all do. I mean, I actually we? feel like I could stand in front of this painting now and talk to somebody. <laughs> Whereas <clears throat> before, I wouldn't have talked to anybody. <laughs> As always. <laughs> we'll have you volunteering in the National Gallery, don't you worry. <laughs> I just do the tea, tea and cake. That's, that's me. So Mara... 
then presumably, mm. well, we know this, don't we? He was, he was one of the revolutionary leaders. There's only four years since the French Revolution, which, unless we're careful with the French Revolution, it's not a revolution of, of working people. It's actually more of a revolution of, I don't know if you call them middle class, but I mean, it's, you know, it's, it's more of a middle ranking yeah. kind of revolution. Um, and uh, they were the ones that they said that stormed the Bastille. Yeah, exactly. And this painting, I mean, David, I mean, famously, um, I, did, I remember the first time I came across David, I was making a film about Napoleon for a series called Great Commanders. And there is a fantastic painting of Napoleon on his steed. Right. And um, this is supposed to be Napoleon crossing the Alps and looking just about as perfect as you could look as a military leader. And the thing that's so interesting about it is that it's fake. The truth of the matter is he crossed the Alps on a donkey and he was probably oh, right. huddled against the cold and looking... I mean... So did David paint that one then? Yeah. Because they said he did become his painter. Yeah. So actually David is is the person. He is the original fake news. <laughs> well, I'm saying the original because actually... <laughs> OK. No, actually, it, it, this, this is a... Um, Again, when I went back, when I went to uh, do a series about the rise and fall of the Roman Empire, mm. and we based that on six Caesars, six, well, Julius Caesar and then five Caesars. And one of them was Augustus. And Augustus was very interesting because actually the accounts read that he was short. Yeah. Uh, in fact, he wore uh, heels to make himself look taller. He had bad teeth. Uh, anyway, he, and he, you know, he was a bit weedy. If you look at his statues, which exist to this day, 2,000 yeah. years later, they show this extraordinarily tough, yeah. fit soldier, bulging biceps, quads, you name it. Um, it's fake. It's not how he looked at all, but nobody knew what he really looked like. Because no. who would get to see him? And these statues were produced and they would go out with legions. And when the legions went out to various parts of the empire, they'd take these statues with them and they'd put them in the town squares and people would say, oh, look at our great great leader the same thing with coins you know they they there are, there are moments in roman history where they're a bit more realistic but generally speaking they're there to kind of promote an image um of a of a leader same thing's happening with napoleon so uh, let me find that let me go on i've got my computer here let's, let's open it up well, i'll find the picture let's have a look at that picture because it is just brilliant no, I have so seen that picture before. Yeah, so that's Napoleon crossing. This is good news. Look at that. <laughs> Look at that steed. It's on its yeah. back back legs and its hair, <laughs> nostrils flaring. Yeah. And there's... Actually, one thing you can learn from this this page that we've opened up here. Look at how different the colours are. Yeah. Never trust, never trust the image that you see on a Wikipedia no. or anything like that. Because that, that's orange there, yellow there bluey green there red there anyway when you pick up all the pictures of these ones as well so you can imagine this picture people see this and they think oh my god what a wonderful guy i want him to be my leader yeah <laughs> and the truth of the matter was he crossed on a donkey and he didn't look like that at all um so, so let's go back to david basically if i have my photo done david is the person to come in any Airbrush us, look yeah. good. <laughs> so Mara obviously has lots of, I mean, actually there's so many examples of people who actually had skin diseases and facial mm. problems and all the rest of it, mm. and the painters have completely ignored all that. Um, oh, and yeah, one, of, I mean, it's, yeah. one of the things about when you look at some of the Spanish artists when they start presenting their kings and queens as they actually looked. Yes. And somehow mm. being allowed to do so and you think, oh, look at that. Look at the chin on that, <laughs> on Philip or whatever it might be. <laughs> so, David, 1787, two years before the revolution, does, does the death of Socrates, and it's all very classical and, you know, statuesque. This is a remarkable painting with Mara, because it's, when you first look at it, you think <clears throat> it's really quite realistic. But, as we're telling, it really isn't. I mean, I guess no. if, you, if, you, if you're about to be stabbed or being stabbed from the front, mm. uh, you probably wouldn't be still holding on to the letter. No. 
all the pain. You probably would have tried to get out of the bath. Mm -hmm. And you probably would have held the wound. Probably would have held the wound. There would have been a hell of a lot more blood. Mm, if you're gonna, definitely. If you're going to die from that. Mm. Um, yeah. And his face, I mean, his face actually looked quite, it looks really beautiful. I don't mm. think it would look like that. But I wonder whether people would have, at the time, when this is so contemporary and so current, mm. I wonder whether people would have admired the painterly side of it or never got past the contemporary nature of this painting. I don't think, I, I doubt that people stood in front of it and go, oh, it's beautiful skin tones. Yeah, yeah, that's true. I think they would have just been shocked by it. Yeah, it's um, just like reading a newspaper though, isn't it? But then you wonder how it was actually disseminated, who actually got to see it. Um, well, I'm assuming the Jacobins. Hmm. I wonder if they made... Um, because it, they want, they would just want them all to carry on with the uprising. I mean, we are a little bit early for copies and prints. Right. Um, I mean, David himself, you know, once he's under the... Um, a protection of, of Napoleon, then he's safe. But even at this time, he's still, you know, he, he, he gets um, imprisoned the following year. This is, a, this is a terrible time. I mean, again, within this kind of higher echelons of society, you were, you know, life was very risky and could be brought to an end very, very quickly. You know, Monsieur Guillotine and his, his well, that, murdering yeah. invention yeah. was put to good use. Mm. Um David, when he was imprisoned, um, you know, looking out of his window at the Luxembourg Gardens, that's pretty much where the Louvre, you know, that's that part of Paris, the Luxembourg Gardens. Oh, OK. Um, and he was imprisoned and then he just, how, how come he got out of them? Because of Napoleon. I wonder when Napoleon actually becomes his, uh, I mean, Napoleon's Friend. still, Napoleon's still on his way up. In fact, yeah. Napoleon basically takes advantage of the chaos. And he emerges through some brilliant self-calculation. He emerges as someone to say, I can, I can save France. Um, he himself has to prove himself as a military leader by um, taking over northern Italy on behalf of France, get, winning it back, I guess, from the Spanish. Um, and then, you know, I mean, David is very well known. He's, he's, he's taught many painters, he had his own rooms in the Louvre, he's not an unknown artist. Um, mm -hmm. So I guess, what, 18, probably not that long after this, when did we just say this painting was 1793? So within a decade, yeah, Napoleon. Um, I'd say that he's, he's become Napoleon's painter. Certainly by the time of, um, there's a moment when Napoleon uh, is crowned, the coronation of, of Napoleon. It's a very famous painting. And it's funny how my films kind of interrelate sometimes, but this is a very famous painting because it's the coronation of him and his empress, Josephine. And famously, you see Napoleon, normally, like in our own coronations here in Britain, there is an archbishop who pl pl places the crown on your head. Yeah. So Napoleon, famously, when he came to power, he said, I, I don't, I, I reject religion. So he tried to um, ban Catholicism. It wasn't that long. Well, he reversed that decision later because he said, I've realised that there's no society without morals and there's no morality without religion. OK. So he kind of backtracked. Yeah. But what he does famously in this painting is he crowns himself. And uh, uh, it's, you, you, it's quite funny that in, in the end they end up with another, you know, sort of head of state who yeah. the the idea was to get rid of yeah. all of that sort of aristocracy, and then and they end up with just Napoleon. A, just a different type of dictator. Mm -hmm. I've often thought actually that it doesn't really matter what the form of political governorship government is yeah it's how benevolent that dictatorship is so would you rather have a corrupt president or a benign <laughs> king you know um 
Mm. There are plenty of people who are anti-monarchy in our country, but then there are others that say, yeah, but would you wanted our head of state to have been, fill in your own name, but Thatcher yeah. or uh -huh. Boris Johnson or... Um, yeah. Yeah, we're going to get we're going to write way off this painting. <laughs> well, <I just laughs> we're wanna... going to get into well areas that I definitely don't know. I need my coloured pens, Phil, and my my notepad. I'm glad you got them. I've got them here. I would feel bereft if you didn't go. I, know. I need my coloured pens. But there's no my pencil. Note... Where's the pencil case? Oh, that's no, all you I'm... need. You'd have to get me one. Have you got the pencils with the little funny oh, yeah, little this... characters on them? <laughs> no, and I need that now in my life. <laughs> yeah. No, this is this is exactly it now. I'm, I'm, take, I'm gone to another level, and I've, I have revised. Well, I feel like I'm doing my GCSE in history. Well, let's see, okay, I just brought this picture up, <clears throat> which so, is the coronation of Napoleon by David. Okay. So have a look, see what he's doing, because it's very significant. There he is. I mean, really complicated picture. Yeah. All the a lot of these faces, people would people would recognise themselves. He's got hold of the crown, oh, okay. and he's going to put it on himself. On himself, okay. Now, one of the implications of this, famously, and this is where like films inter interconnect, Beethoven, who, even though he's in he's in the empire, he's in the Austrian Austro-Hungarian Empire. Yeah, they are rivals to the French Empire. Mm -hmm. Even so, it's quite interesting. Beethoven. Uh, voiced support for some of the revolutionary um, beliefs coming out of France, which I've always thought was a slightly dangerous thing to do, bearing in mind that Beethoven was a, you know, he relied on, on his court, the Austro-Hungarian court in Vienna for, for, for work. So he's taking a risk. Oh, yeah, of course. Mm -hmm. But and it, anyway, he's, he is at this point writing a, 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 a symphony dedicated to Napoleon. And, and just at the point when he's writing this symphony, he is made aware of this painting. He's made aware that Napoleon has crowned himself. And he suddenly realizes that this great man that he thought was going to lead this kind of uh, a new France with, with equality for all and the kind of things he then mentions later in his ninth symphony, you know, about humanity being together and all this kind of stuff, he suddenly realizes that he's no better than all the rest. Okay. And so is that the symphony he wrote for him, the ninth? No, no, no. So it's actually the third. Ah, okay. And if you look at the original score, mm. where the word Napoleon is, he is scratched out so viciously, so ferociously, it's just a hole in the paper. Oh, okay. Um, and it's basically this moment when... Where he sees that. But we've jumped ahead. So I know, it was good, though. <laughs> Nothing like a diversion. So 1804... <laughs> Here's David, and he is the king's, sorry, he the king. He is Napoleon's painter. Yeah. Ten years earlier, he's part of the revolution. He's, he's painting this guy, Mara, who he obviously mm. sympathizes with, who again was one of the, you know, brains of the revolution. Um, so he's obviously gone on quite a journey himself. And in fact, if you go to the, the Louvre now, which is an extraordinary place, um, you know, there are some really huge paintings by by David. I mean, he, he really did rise to quite a status. I feel like I've got to go back to everything I've ever done now since we've started this. I have been to the Louvre and oh, you know, I know it was fantastic, but I haven't spent enough time in there to appreciate some of these things for sure. Yeah, but it's, it's impossible. With yeah, you. it's so big. It is so big and it's so busy. So busy. I, I you know, I, I, yeah. I'm always a bit put off when I go to Paris about going mm. to the Louvre because I, the queues put me off, and you mm. have to pre-book tickets. Yeah, so I haven't actually been blue. But I tend to wait until we're going there to film. Well, that yeah, and That's then quite, I, and then That's I, really lovely. and then I go in, and and obviously when we're filming, there's nobody, nobody else there. So no, it's exactly perfect. About. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, the style of this painting yeah. is interesting. Mm -hmm. So. You know, we, we've talked before about Impressionists. Um, it must have been a right old scene, though, Phil, when, when, when David walked in, because he wouldn't have just walked in five or ten minutes afterwards, so it would have been really, really messy 
to have to clean that up and then sort of start sketching immediately. And, it, and it, well, have you have you read somewhere that he's like the first person in? Well, I doubt it. No, I no, didn't read that. His no. assistant must have been. In must first. have been. But even then, would they have instantly thought to tidy it up? I don't well, know. we know again it's propaganda, don't we? Because yeah. I mean, I've I've read somewhere else that, for example, she didn't she didn't try to flee. No. So she's still standing there. Yeah. Which I mean, is a bit of a strange one. She didn't try to flee at all, and then no, maybe she I mean, just she felt t- really passionately about how determined she was to do it. Unless she thought that somehow she could justify it before the court, mm. or, or she's just realised that um, the, the 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 dagger, the knife, was actually stuck in his chest, whereas in the painting, all oh, right, yeah, it's it's there on the on the floor. I mean, if he was intending this for propaganda, yes, then I would imagine that his studio, you know, because he was he was you know he was a He's in his mid forties at this point. He's a successful painter, so I'd imagine that his and he's got assistants and so forth. So I'd imagine that they made copies. Um, there's certainly one copy, as I mentioned before, at the Louvre. So maybe that was made shortly thereafter, and those copies are sent around. Again, you've always got to kind of ask yourself: Well, sent where, and who mm. would have seen it? Yeah. But. but um, I mean, the other thing about it being propaganda, it is actually really simple. So it looks like he's leading quite a simple life. Yeah. Not lavish at all. Yeah. There's the man of letters, man of thought. Mm. Just even the crate. Yeah. Just there. Sort of the cloth. It's it's all just so simple, isn't it? Whereas no gold braid. No. That's and I'm true. imagining that most of the paintings at the time, and if you're saying a lot of them were embellished anyway, would have yeah. had lots of yeah. lovely gold things. and So That's, it's the perfect painting to get everyone riled up. Yeah, that you can imagine, can't you? You could easily have put kind of nice paintings on the wall and yeah. golden candlestick. And, exactly. And the background's just dark. But I've been looking at Caravaggio recently, and it's, it's a similar thing, which is you owe... Uh, just including what's necessary. Mm. Very little extraneous detail. You know, I'd always be, I can't, I'm not an artist, but from those times when I'd kind of dabbled, I'm, I, I overfill my frame. You know, I put in a window frame and a pot plant and a, you know. <clears throat> well, can we get some of your pictures out, Phil? No. I definitely... didn't know you do paintings. No, no, I don't do paintings, but it's okay. just, just like doodling. All right. Um, <laughs> this is, this is, and again, if you if you look at the wall, you've got one light source. Yes. Top right. Mm. So it's, it's very theatrical. I mean, that could be a stage set, couldn't it, with yeah. a simple backdrop. It is a brilliant painting, though. If you want to learn about the mm. French Revolution, like I had to this week, I mean, my colour pens have been going mad. <laughs> and, and I've learnt loads, which is great. So if I did go and see it there in Belgium, I could actually talk about it. Because he he ends up living in Belgium, which is why he ends up there. Okay. I think I think that um, the painting gets returned to him a couple of years after it's painted, and it just kind of I guess he just carried it around with him, and kept it in storage. Yeah. In the end, he ends up in Brussels, and and the, and therefore the painting has remained there ever since. For. Well, 200 years. I think he dies, what, mid-1820s, so. Um, and it's somewhere that I definitely, I mean, I don't even think I would have probably gone, to be fair. I think now I might. Yeah, I oh know. Yeah, I should. I should definitely go and see it in the flesh. Brussels is a, yeah. well, it's a wonderful city, but they got some wonderful art to be seen there. I think I might be more interested in the food as always. <laughs> Waffles. <laughs> Chips, mayonnaise, Chips. mayonnaise and tomato Chips. sauce. And so they do those really nice beers. And they do. <laughs> that are fruit flavoured. Yeah. Is that right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'm sure, I'm sure, I'm sure these guys had a, had a tipple. So we could go see the painting, nip out for lunch afterwards and more discussion. One day, one day we'll be you able to travel know. again. Yeah, I can't wait. I do think that um, comment you made right at the beginning about how, you know, David has studied... Entombments of Christ, you know, Christ 
the, you know, the descent from the cross and all these kind of things. Mm. I mean, it was a challenge to an artist, one they readily took up, you know, painting the human body, particularly a kind of, in this case, the top half of a nude. You know, it allowed them to really demonstrate their skill as an artist. Right, yeah. Um, you can imagine it's, it's, well, you could argue it's easier when somebody's clothed. True. Not always, but... Mm. Um, I mean, it does make him look quite beautiful. And very vulnerable. Beautiful mm. and vulnerable. Mm. I mean, that is, you know, it's a human life which has been ended with one yeah. stab. Oh, by the way, mm. if you look at the bottom there, it yes. says L'An de, year two. Mm. And again, you know, you know your French Revolution, they decided to start the calendar again. Uh -huh. and, so you start uh, right. And this is year two. So interesting. Amazing, amazing, mm. amazing times. What, are, what do you think those little, the little note and the little piece of paper mm. on the edge of the box are? Have you come across that? No, mm. I didn't in, the, in my revision. I would just say previous, maybe that's because he is just doing all his work there. Previous mail or more of hers? Oh, here we go. I've gone to a close-up. Wow. So it says in French... Vous donnera, you will give this assigna, assignment, d'être, I think it's d'être, to be so mère, mm -hmm. mother, des enfants of children, and therefore, hmm. Okay. So okay. part of her letter? Maybe. I think I read somewhere that she got in because she told him there was some I don't know, coup or ring or something's going on that enthralled him. But you can see how positioned it all is. <laughs> there's no way. If he's just been stabbed like that, that's going to still be like that. It, there's no way. No. He would that, be flailing about all over the place, wouldn't he, really? Yeah. Even the, even the head seems almost mm. too far over. Mm. So I'm just looking at that letter, the letter in his hand, 13th of July, 1793. So 72, he hasn't gone long de there, 1793. No. So... Charlotte Corday to Citizen Marat. Oh, given that I am unhappy, I have a right to your something, your help, your advice, maybe. Huh. Okay, so that's how she got in. Well, we did that interview in the week, didn't we? And you said, and it was really lovely, about arts all around us and take some time to look at a painting. Hmm. Don't just glance look away the more you look the more you see and like I said to you when you said this picture I was like well I'm just gonna sit back and relax Phil's gonna have to do it all <laughs> and then I thought no I better do a revision and uh and now this week I've gone French Revolution storming of the Bastille I even could talk about this painting and it didn't take much to actually enjoy this painting and enjoy finding out about it. Hmm. And if you'd have said to me, Laura, this is the painting we're doing, Death of Morat, I would have thought, that's not, that's not for me. Yeah. It's not something I'm going to be remotely interested in. And it is interesting. And almost sort of that piece of history, hmm. the French Revolution is coming out of that one painting. If you were studying for something... Well, it's interesting. My one of the reasons I chose it to look at is that my daughter, yeah, who's twenty one. You think of the millions of paintings she yeah. could have chosen. As as I said, what I said, um, Ella, tell me a painting to talk about. She said, "Oh, I'll talk about the death of Mara yeah. by David." I mean, interesting. I mean, she loves history. She loves drama, spectacle. This is around the time of Lemmy's, so the Lemmy's is a bit later. But, yeah. But, I mean, she loves all she that. Loves, yeah, and that was um, why she picked that painting then. Yeah. And rightly so, because it totally has... It's fascinating. Isn't yeah, it? really fascinating. One, one avenue that people could take from this is to, um, well, it's a couple. Either think about the way in which leaders, whether they're kings or presidents or whatever they want to call themselves, choose to have themselves portrayed, that's always really interesting. Yeah. And, or secondly, just look at the work of David 
You know, he had an extraordinary journey, and to end up essentially as Napoleon's personal painter. painter. Yeah, wow. Um, and you know, it's only two hundred years ago, and in, in in the history of the universe, it's just you know, yeah, barely a fluttering of an eyelid um, since these guys were 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 painting and communicating through their art. Fascinating, right? Very. <laughs> Thank you, Laura. Okay. On to the next. <laughs> Offer a cuppa. <laughs> Thank you for listening to the Painting of the Week podcast. For more information, please visit our website at seventh-art.com or contact us by emailing info at seventh-art.com. See you next time.